mic and said, I'm the only thing that's going to be a room full of people at lunch. So, my name's Ian Hill. I work for a consultancy headquartered in Charlottesville, Virginia. We also have a new office in the Research Triangle Raleigh Durham area of North Carolina. They're called Willow Tree. We focus primarily on mobile apps, iOS, um, added Android several, several years ago. I've also started going into front end web development and also back end web development. We work for a lot of companies, uh, a lot of large enterprises, which is great because unlike startups, they do pay their bills. And it also gives us a lot of opportunities to experiment with new technologies. So we try new things all the time as new projects are coming up for these large companies. And I do believe that culture is the best thing uh, that a company needs to be focusing on. And we have a great culture that manifests in excellent products and client satisfaction. So Swift. Um, how many people here have written Swift? Okay, about five. Wonderful. Um, I am an iOS engineer right now, um, tvOS also when the uh, right project comes along, and I love it. Uh, I want you guys to love it. So think of your two favorite programming languages and pretend that they had a baby. That baby is Swift. It doesn't even matter what two programming languages you want to pick. Your favorite languages are C and Ruby. It's like, oh honey, your raw performance my expressiveness, I see it. Go and Java, oh, your objects and your structs. Lisp and Fortran, seriously, that's ours. Doesn't look anything like us. It's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's compiler's so slow. It's ours and we love it. <laughs> Which actually also explains why I love Swift, because I'm an iOS developer, so I just get whatever Apple gives us. <laughs> it's not simple. It's ours, and we love it. So Swift is actually a, what we call a multi-paradigm language. Uh, so it has object-oriented components, it has functional components, it has imperative components, it has generic components. And instead of calling it multi-paradigm, I like to think about it as being a pragmatic language. It lets you choose the tool that you want um, that's best for the job, in, in theory. It has some rough edges too. Also, like babies, we're going to judge it on a curve. It's only two years old, it's adorable, it'll grow into itself. It's also open source. Um, and they, Apple open sourced this last December, which I think is amazing. And the first thing I thought was amazing was like, man, Apple is not exactly known for transparency and yet they're going to open up this programming language and let anyone contribute to it. But then I started thinking, that's actually a really bad thing to be happy with from Apple. It's like I have two kids and my wife takes them out to the park and if one starts acting up, everyone's like, you are a terrible mother. But I just like take my kids out in the front yard, have a beer on the porch, and like each other with sticks and neighbors are stopping. Thank you for spending time with your kids. You are a wonderful father. <laughs> so, it's not just enough, we can't judge Apple on the curve. Um, but one thing that is actually, I think, sincerely lovable is how they open source it. So not only does Swift and all of the components to build Swift live on GitHub, like all that we do as well, but they opened it up, uh, the evolution of the language itself as an open source process called Swift Evolution. You go to GitHub, Apple, Swift Evolution, and there's a Swift Evolution mailing list. And anyone who sees something with the language that they would like to change, or they'd like to add a new feature, or they think the API could be improved, anyone can propose this, go to the mailing list, go talk directly to the core developers who participate in this mailing list, go talk to the community, uh, community advocates, and say, this is what I think it should be, and go put together a proposal and send it out, and then the community will discuss it. Um, and if it is deemed a good feature, um, it'll actually get built, and this is, this is actually true. Swift 3 just got released uh, officially with Xcode 8, um, just like two days ago, and if you go to the release notes on Swift.org's site, you can look through all the API changes that happened. There were a lot that took care of like two days to upgrade their projects. Um, but you can see that like more than half of them came from the community. So that level of community involvement and changing the actual language itself, I think, is laudable. It's also very hackable. Um, everything is up there on GitHub. Everyone can just play with it. And if something's a little bit hackable, we're going to hack it a little bit. So when it was open source, Apple of course made it run for Mac OS, iOS, TOS, WatchOS, whatever, next OS, and they also promised it had Linux support. And it did on day one. But then the community got together and they said, well, wouldn't it be great if Swift ran on Android? Maybe it should run through BSD. My favorite one just came in a few months ago. 
PlayStation 4. And then there's an operating system by the uh, new up and coming underdog for developer Mindshare that everyone's rooting for Microsoft Windows. It's not actually a joke, I think it's true. Okay, so why do we want to share code between platforms? And I don't think this is a silly question, actually. I think, I think this is, deserves to be looked at in greater depth. Um, it's two parts. Why share code at all? Um, is this the jet fuel that we should be leaving on the tarmac? Thank you. Uh, and, and actually, if, if I were to say right now, um, for a lot of projects, I think it is. I don't think that this is production, or at least with Swift, I don't think it's production ready. I don't think sharing code is the actual ultimate goal. I think client satisfaction is the ultimate goal. Um, but, you know, let's, let's concede. Okay, what do we want to share code for? Um, and the best thing is, like, why would you ever want to learn, learn a new language? Like, why would you choose the best tool for the job when you can do it in JavaScript? <laughs> An enterprise architect in the making. So, uh, but I do think, as, uh, as Brian spoke yesterday uh, in the opening keynote, um, it is helpful to learn one thing at a time. So, I work in Swift, and I work with mobile developers, a few US developers, and all we do all day long are interact with server APIs. And most mobile developers that I've encountered don't have a background in web development. They wanted to program a new app and get rich. They have no idea how servers work. I'm not going to ask them to go all the way down to the metal, but it is nice if they could learn a little bit about how APIs and tells are actually built so they understand that they don't include a content type header and server stuff. So they need a good reason for that instead of just saying the API guys are done. So, that, and I love, I love Swift, so I want all the server developers here to try developing a little server project in Swift. Learn one thing at a time. I think that's valuable. Our use case at Willowtree is we do build mostly mobile apps, and so every app that we build, we usually build two of. We build an Android app and an iOS app, and that's a lot of duplication. And the fun thing about the duplication is that as best as the tightest communication loops that we can achieve, things still aren't perfect. This communication is an imperfect process. And we'll have something like the client API changes. And the iOS app, well, it always behaves perfectly, and the Android app will break. Usually it happens that they both break and they break differently, and that's a fun conversation to have with a client. And then another use case, the one that I'm going to explore a little bit in a few minutes in code, is sharing code between the server and the client. Um, this is a time where we're also usually creating a lot of duplication. We have these models and this business logic that we invest all this time in, and then we have to rebuild it. We want to have client-side validation. We have to build it again. We're sending these models down the wire. We have two copies of them everywhere. And back to JavaScript. They have solutions for both of these things already. Just do a hybrid app, an isomorphic web app. Okay. Well, why share Swift? And this is just personal for me because I love it, but it also is because my other main alternative at work right now is C++. Not what I want to spend my time doing. But the other reason is that I started my career in web development in 2004 with JTE and uh, Oracle Database. First day of my first job, uh, they didn't have a project for me to work on, so they handed me an Oracle um, tome of like 900 pages and said, here, read this. And then, a few years later, I discovered the, the spring, the uprising of web frameworks. I started working with Symfony and PHP and Django and Python and then Rails and Ruby. And that really, that really stuck with me. It struck a nerve. And the ethos of making the programmer happy um, really made my job better, made my life better. And I think, I think Swift does this too. Not only is it delightful, we don't have to sacrifice any of the power. Okay, so where does Swift fit on the server? So you got like the JVM, Microsoft Stack, interpreted languages, binary compiled languages, type languages, interpreted languages. I think Swift fits most closely with Go. And my prediction is that Swift on the server will succeed to some capacity, and the mindshare it's going to steal are the disaffected Ruby and Python programmers who went to Go for speed and performance but who will eventually abandon Go to get back to a richer modeling language, a richer uh, set of tools, uh, generics. So they're both programmatic, um, but they're pragmatic in different ways. Go is like, um, it's like a grandparent's tool belt, and it's like really thick leather, and it's like been worn enough that it just like feels just right, except maybe in a few places the leather's got kind of like cracking, and it's got that like, lead um, plum, you know, that like ever since you were a kid, you just want to pluck you chalk everywhere. Whereas Swift is like, like a new hipster tool belt right out of Portland. And uh, it's got that nice 
nice laser finder. It's still a little yuppy, you're kind of getting in front of but you're wearing a suede tool belt. It's a little weird. But no, uh, the modeling support Swift, it is newer. Uh, it is uh, based on um, some academic research that has not really made it into most mainstream programming languages. Uh, I can tower and look at us in the industry and they say, like, seriously, that's what you're working with? We were there like 20 years ago. And Swift gets closer. Um, a couple of features of it that I think are absolutely amazing. Um, enums with associated types, these are some types. Um, they allow you to, I'll show an example of the same code, but they allow you to uh, really model that or condition, so you can be in this state or this state, but while you're in those states, you have that data. Uh, an example, we always find we have users and maybe um, we have users in different plans, right? You have like a, a basic plan where they have this set of features and this set of data, and an advanced plan or a premium plan where they have a different set of data. And what we often do is we model that as like, okay, um, well, this user, that column's just empty, and in our object here, that's just going to be null. And so Swift has tools that let us get around all that to where we model our types more closely to the common domain. It's like what's a strong typing system versus a weak typing system. I think the official answer on Wikipedia is that there is no official answer. But the one that I've been experimenting with that I recently learned is a strong typing system is a system in which your types are constrained more closely to the values that they can possibly contain. I'll show a concrete example of this too in a minute. But if you think about um, something in Ruby, Ruby is typed. It's just a type can be anything. It's like anything anywhere. You can do the same thing in Swift. We have a, a literal any. You can assign anything to it. But you can also constrain it more closely. Say you have a function that takes an int and you're going to divide something by that. Obviously, there's one value that's not going to work. You can't divide by zero. And so if you just take an int in, that's what's called a partial function. It's going to crash when you divide by zero. But we can use the type system in itself to protect us from that. We can have a non-zero int type and only allow that type to be instantiated if the value of the underlying int is not zero. And now we accept that function, that uh, type as a parameter to our function. Now we have a total function. We succeed for all possible values that can come into that function. That's stronger type. It's more strongly typed. It's constrained out of the you know, 2 to the 64 um, possible values to 2 to the 64 minus 1. We just tighten that bit. So anyway, frameworks. What would a web development language be without web development frameworks? And there are a bunch. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about um, them specifically. I'm going to use one to show you some examples. But uh, the first one that uh, debuted is made by a startup called Perfectly Soft, which is sort of an awkward name for a company. Uh, but they had a perfect web framework <laughs> on GitHub. Uh, the next one is not quite a startup, but IBM um, has put an offering out there, also open source, called Kitora. And they take a slightly different approach and they break everything out into a million modules, um, which is great for reusability. Um, and then the third one I'll mention is one I'll do a little bit of demonstration with. It's called Vapor. I think it's sort of like a community darling. It's a lot closer to Rails, a lot closer to Django. Uh, well, I think those two are very, very far apart. It's a lot closer to Rails. Uh, so now, let's look at a little bit of code. Swift sources and tests 
And this library was created with a Swift package manager. Swift package manager, like, um, like Crystal was mentioned yesterday with shards, is a decentralized package manager. Everything's going to be um, controlled by Git. Um, it'll go and fetch your uh, library that you ask it to, and we'll go ahead and build it and fetch its dependencies and try to resolve the whole dependency graph for you. So, in the simplest case, our package is just a package of code with a description of what the name is. So, let's just be in code. Conditionals. 
Um, and what Guard will do is it actually mandates that if you fail your Guard statement, you have to exit the scope. So if we have a title, if we have a speaker, if we have a slug, then we will actually initialize our type. And if we don't, we'll return a nil. It's a failable initializer. This is the mechanism by which we can use types to constrain um, values to what we want. If we were to do a non-zero int, we would create a failable initializer so that if the value was zero, it wouldn't succeed. And then we want to do just a little bit of validation um, for this demo. And so we have another you know, validity. And this one's a little bit different because it has what's called our associated values. And this is fascinating because in the valid case, it's just valid, cool, valid, good job. But in the invalid case, we're going to attach some data to that. So only when we're invalid and when, when, when we are, we must include a string piece of data with this. And this is a very simple example that can get arbitrarily complex as your app scrub. So we'll just do a quick little validation if our title is fewer than 10 characters. We'll return that it's invalid with a message that we can present to the user. And otherwise, we're going to return that it is valid. All right, let's look at the server code. So this is Vapor. And I'm not, I'm not actually saying you should use Vapor, although I think it might be familiar to you if you use one of the other uh, modern interpreter language uh, frameworks. Um, but you absolutely don't have to. I'm personally hoping that the Swift community sort of settles more in the Go line of uh, tighter micro frameworks and just using the standard library as much as possible. So, uh, Vapor is, um, I think it's code running in the clouds. This is water vapor, and the metaphor extends to droplets, which is what they use to run their code. I didn't make these names. Uh, but so we'll link up our talks uh, as a resource. This is some um, um, helpful APIs to create a RESTful API. And we'll set up a talks controller. All right, so we're importing our library now on line three. So we actually have access to our underlying model that we just wrote. And we're just going to do a few pieces of the, um, of the controller, of, of what a full RESTful API suite would be. We're just going to get an index, and then we're going to be able to um, post to create a new item, and we're going to be able to retrieve one. And the language that Vapor uses is index, store, and show. So there's a bunch here, and we're not going to worry about all of it, but on index, we're going to retrieve all of our talks, and we're going to render them as JSON. On store, we're going to pull the JSON out of the request body and make sure that we create a node. That's that guard let or a, a talk, a guard let talk um, from this node. Nodes, you don't need to worry about the papers, internals, or how they communicate data back and forth. Uh, but the key thing here is that if we don't get it, we're going to immediately have to bail out of this, and we'll return an error response. And then we'll validate it because we can't trust the client ever, right? So we're going to validate it. And then as long as that happens, um, here is where we potentially save it to a data source. But for this demo, we're just going to return with it. So to make all of this happen, we need to extend to talk a little bit. And this is where the extensibility um, of uh, types really comes in handy. So when you try to request a resource, um, you do something like you know, your root URL slash the resource name slash the resource ID or a slug. Um, and so Vapor does this with a string initializable protocol. They say, hey, can you give me an item if I give you a string? String initializable. And it's an optional or available initializer because, well, maybe you don't have that item in your data store. And so we'll implement this. I have a list of all talks and talk data, just a whole big array, no big deal. And we'll just look for the first one where the slug match will turn out awesome. And then to communicate between the different data types that Vapor expects, we know that we have this talk that can do, uh, that has the data we want, but it doesn't, Vapor doesn't know how to work with it because it's talking about the protocols internally in its system that it knows about. So we'll extend it with node representable, JSON representable, implement how we can create a talk from a node, how we can make a node, um, and with that we can use our string, it's a string dictionary, so we get to take advantage of the code that we're sharing in multiple places. And then if we want to return it as a response, we can make sure we're response representable because uh, with Swift, most things are genericized out, but we have to be very particular about that. It's not like Go where uh, interfaces are implicitly satisfied. We have to specifically declare that they satisfy these protocols. Alright, this part will be hard to see, but we'll back to the code in a second. So we're going to now make an app of this. Actually, for that, we're going to build a 
server and make sure that works. So, my first defense is I'm trying to compile it, so I think it's time for my first joke. Uh, how many optometrists does it take to change a light bulb? One. Or two. One. Or two. Alright, we're going to let it build. Uh, so I set up a simple app to demonstrate this. So we're going to have uh, a table view controller. This is the uh, interface that you're probably familiar with from like every app ever, which is going to show a bunch of cells of the data. And then we're going to have another screen to add one, um, which just has some text input, title, speaker, slug, and a submit button. Hey, our server started up. So I just curl the index of it and see all of our data comes back nicely. Alright, so we want to build our table view controller and this code is imperfect at best, but I think it shows a little bit of the language and uh, it's enough to get data right, right onto the screen. So we're just going to do a, um, a get to our talks um, endpoint and we're going to get a bunch of data back. And so this if line 20, let task with URL session share data task with URL. And what follows is a closure. Swift has uh, functions as first class citizens in the language, and it also has syntactic sugar for what's called a trailing closure. If the last parameter to a function is a closure, you can just pass it at the end, which lets you um, create uh, rich APIs that look like control flow from the language. So the closure will call back with data response error, and we're just going to make sure that everything's hunky dory. We're going to make sure we don't have an error. We're going to make sure that our response is an HTTP or our response. I've never seen this in ever. I don't know how on earth it wouldn't be, but it's a strongly typed language, so we're going to ask us to defend ourselves a little bit. We're going to do it. We're going to make sure our status code is appropriate. We're going to make sure we have data. So let data equal data. This is a pattern you'll see a lot in Swift. And the data on the right is an optional data. That's a data question mark. So it's a, it's a maybe. maybe we have data and maybe we don't. So the guard let syntax, if let works as well, will say, hey, if you have a value, let's pull it out. If you don't, I'm going to bail out of this entirely. So let data equal data. Data on the left is non-optional when it succeeds. Data on the right is optional and we're checking it. And then we're going to use the API to pull JSON object out. Um, and then we're going to make sure that the JSON object is the type we expect, which in this case is an array of dictionaries or JSON objects. And then, down a little bit further, we're just going to take our talks, and we have this array of dictionaries, and we're going to flat map them, and we're going to, uh, to transform them with our map function, which is going to take every value in that array and map it to a value of a new type. We're going to transform it from a dictionary of string to string into our talk. And since it's purely functional, or not purely functional, uh, but since it does have first class functional support, we're just going to pass in our initializer. We don't have to write any code to actually do this. We're going to just pass in the initializer to take that dictionary and render out in the talk. We'll set those to our talks, and then we will um, just reload our table to make sure uh, that the user is updated with the data. Sweet. So that actually. That actually, uh, the first talk with my curl and the second get talk is um, our application running. So we are using the server now to communicate this model that is an entirely different library that is used also by the client to consume this data. And then the last thing I'll show is if we want to create a new one. And so this is another common task when you have clients and servers is you want the user experience for a client to be as good as possible so that when they do something bad, like don't input anything at all, that they get this feedback immediately. We don't have to do a round trip to the server. So we need some data. And title is too short. This is client side validation using the shared validation logic that the server is also doing. And then when we make our title long enough, we succeed. So we pass our server or client side validation that we're sharing this code with, and then went to the server, passed the server side validation as well, since it can't trust us, and then finally we uh, add it to the data store and respond. Alright, that's the demo. If uh, okay, back.
to. All right, next steps. Um, if you guys uh, enjoy any of this, I do encourage you to learn more about Swift. Um, the best resource for learning about Swift is Apple's programming language guide for Swift. It's some of the, the best written programming language documentation I've ever read. And then the two talks that you want to watch, if you like watching videos, the two things that you really want to get into to get a feel for how strong Swift can be are both from WWDC last summer. Uh, the first one is called Protocol Oriented Programming, where Apple dives into the real differences between Swift and other programming languages. It's also known as the Krusty Talk, um, which you'll see because they have a character that they named Krusty. He's the old fangled programmer who actually does everything right. Um, and then the other one you want to do is uh, building better maps with value types, which is Apple talking about the value type system. Value types are going to be the enums, the structs, uh, tuples, as opposed to uh, the reference type and Swift, which are classes. So I got to thank you guys. Yeah, so the question is, if I'm going to paraphrase, like, is it, is it different than using JavaScript everywhere? Um, yeah, no, I just like Swift better. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's for this, um, so this is nowhere near production ready on any other platform, and I would not do this in the near future. Um, but I do think it will be, and I think it will be a better option than JavaScript everywhere, or a better option than Java everywhere, or other alternatives. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys.